like to call to order the special meeting of Joliet Junior College Electoral Board, January 21st, 2 p.m. in U Building. Call the roll. Okay, Mahalik. Present. Morales. Here. Wonderlich. Here. At this time, Jose oh. Garcia is also present as well. Right. These were the electoral board members. Okay. Uh, going on to the next item, number three, public comments. We have got Mr. Chair. May I just make a, a request of the board to relocate public comment on the agenda to ensure that there is no bias from any comments that might influence any of the decisions this electoral board needs to make today? Well, it was posted that our public comments will be read from 205 to 210. I, I believe that can be adjusted, though, on the fly, which is why I'm asking you to do so for I the integrity to, of the decision. I'll have to repeat. You know, it's it's within the discretion of this board and the chair. If you'd want to move the agenda item, uh, I do note, which I didn't note uh, until it was pointed out to me that public comments were to be heard from 205 to 210. Um, but you still have discretion. Uh, so it's within your province to move it um, to after the hearing or not. The because public might have more not, to comment on after the hearings. Pardon? The public might have even more to comment on after the hearings. Could you identify yourself for the record, please? Sure. Just Ryan Morton, attorney for Ms. Broderick. Okay. So I will ask the other two, the other two uh, electoral board trustees, Jake or Alicia, do you want to go as is or do you want to put it, move it back? It doesn't really matter to me. I think uh, as long as they're heard, I mean, we can do it first or we can do it second. So, Alicia? Um, I think because people were already prepared for a very small window of time frame and they were taking time out of their work, uh, I think maybe we should stick to what we had planned originally um, for that reason. Uh, and I don't know how long this is going to go, So, but I, I will leave the decision to you. Uh. Yeah, this was this was posted. With that being said, we've only got unless there's somebody that's going to call in, we've only got one public comment. So just going to read it real quick. Thank you for the consideration. You have two. Two, two, two. two. The, one, the letter. Oh yes, we, I'm sorry. We've got two. Um, first one was from Miss Susanna Ibera, dear President. Yes, I am here. Oh, she's here. You are here. I am here. OK, I will read your comments. Uh, dear President, I am a former student with a student with a student currently enrolled at JJC. And one who has already graduated from JJC, I'm requesting to speak at tonight's special meeting regarding Maureen Brock. Roderick's comments with sincerely Susanna Bear. OK, so if you want to speak. OK, Miss Sibera, go ahead. How much time do you have? She said how much time does she have? It's usually three minutes. OK, um, then you can start my three minutes now. Um, let me just tell you with regards to uh, Maureen Broderick, uh, there are some things that I have seen online. It was shared widely. Let me tell you all that my daughter is a new student. This is her first week at JJC. Like I said, I'm a former student. My son is a graduate. These comments were really disturbing, including Ms. Broderick saying, there is turmoil to hit on 120 of 2021. Be prepared, you Biden supporters. Let me tell you, I'm a Biden supporter. So is my daughter who goes to this school. And these comments are inflammatory and almost sound like threats. And then she goes on to say she has her son-in-law who is there, and it was not fake news. Buses of Antifa and Black Lives Matter were brought in and escorted by the police, huh? She goes on and on and on and on. And let me just tell you something. 
there are a lot of Black Lives Matter supporters that go to GJC um, to, to believe that you would even spread or talk about what your son, if that is the case, or your son-in-law, if that is the case, is a Capitol mm-hmm. Police, and you're talking about what a Capitol Police has seen in Washington, I don't know that anything would be secure with you as a trustee and board member if you're that loose with information. It really concerns me. My daughter is a young Latina woman, okay? Those comments that you made are very concerning and very Mm -hmm. upsetting. And I don't want you anywhere around uh, any decisions that have to do with this school with that kind of attitude. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the second uh, is from KLAC, Committee for of African American and Latino Concerns, which I met with this morning, and Dr. Mitchell. They asked me to read this short. Note the Committee of African American and Latino American Concerns, KLAC are communicating its displeasure regarding the comments made by Trustee Broderick Broderick on via social media in January. As a representing representative of the college, Trustee Broderick has a responsibility to respect, advocate, and vote unbiasedly for every constituent associated with the college and its diverse population. Historically, minority employees and students of the college have experienced systematic racial inequities. Within the last several months, it appeared as if we were on the path of healing with kaleidoscope training, diversity, equity, and inclusion talk sessions, diversity-focused book club meetings, as well as the recent hires of minority executive level staff. Comments like those conveyed by Trustee Broderick make employees feel as if we're not gained any traction. Joliet Junior College is the nation's first community college. We were trailblazers in setting the standards for community college, and we now have an opportunity to continue to be a trailblazer for equality for all. Any other further call and comments that we know of? If not, that piece will be, section three will be concluded. The the reason for the electoral board is to see if the petitions and objections of two candidates are valid. Um, The other comments are comments that were made because it is a special board meeting and we always have public comments. With that being May. Moving on to item four, approval of January 11th, 2021 meeting minutes. Is Miss Betty Washington here? Hi, I am virtually. Yes. Yes. Um, Betty conveyed to me that she had a question with some of the minutes. And Betty, if you want to. Uh, Describe your concerns. Yes, uh, under public comments, I'd just like to draw your attention to the, it's a comment by Ms. Dolores Hermanson, uh, which says, I strenuously object to the consolidated election petitions of Maureen Broderick and Betty Washington as candidates for nomination to the Office of Board Trustee for Joliet Junior College. Those that praise sedition have no place in our educational system. Please remove these candidates from the ballot as they are traitors and not fit for public office. First, I just like to say I take offense to Ms. Hermanson, who does not know me, to her comment. Uh, I am a lifetime member of the NAACP, a trusted resident of Joliet. 
I would not engage in such uh, rhetoric. I was not involved. I think where the miscommunication is that my petitions were challenged because of some of the signatures. It has nothing to do with uh, the comments from Ms. Broderick. So I do want that clarification made to the other trustees, the board, and the administration of Joliet Junior College. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. So our secretary will note that Betty's objections to the minutes. Mm -hmm. With that, other than that, can I have a motion to approve the minutes of so January 11th? Second. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on, hearing for case number 2021-EB-1. This time it'd be appropriate if the parties could introduce themselves uh, for the record, please. Would the objector go first and please identify uh, himself? My name is Drew D. Dzinskis, and I am the objector in this case. Thank you, Mr. Dzinskis. Ryan Morton, I am the attorney for the candidate, Maureen Broderick. Are there any preliminary matters that either the objector or the candidate wish to bring to this board before we proceed to hearing? Okay, being that there are no preliminary matters, um, the electoral board is calling, as the chair pointed out, 2021 EB1, Mr. Dzinkis, uh did I get that right? Dzinskis, and depending on what part of the world you're from, it could also be Dushinskis. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm from Joliet, so I'll say Dushinskis. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you, do you, uh, you are the objectors, so please proceed. Thank you, everyone, for coming here today and taking time out of your busy schedules. Uh, my objection, as written, stands for itself, I believe. Uh, it is a very clear, substantive argument that the election code requires uniformity between the statement of candidacy and the petitions, which Trustee Broderick or Vice Chair Broderick did not meet. Uh, the case law being referred to is in the upper left-hand corner of the statement of candidacy as well. This same logic applied means that you can collect uh, 1,100 signatures for park board uh, and not be able to get on the ballot to run for U.S. Senate because there is a fatal inconsistency between the statement of candidacy and the petitions. Uh, and that is the crux of my argument, is that uh, the election authority uh, must not guess what the candidate is running for it must be clear in the statement of candidacy and in the petitions and uniform. And that's all. Thank you very much. Does the objector wish to proceed at this time? I mean, does the candidate wish to proceed as the objector has concluded? There's no further evidence, right, Mr. Dushinskis? No, sir. It's all stated clearly in my objection. Thank you. Will the candidate uh, wish to proceed now? Yes, would you like me to step up there or stay here? Uh, if the Whatever board, you want. If the board okay. can hear you, you can stay there. Okay. I'll, can the court reporter, can you hear him? It would be better, okay.
And before I proceed, can I just confirm that the, the board has received the response to the objectives petition that I filed last night? I don't think I have it. Do you have it, Jim? I, I have a copy of it. Um, Mr. Harvey, you, you, you weren't able to pass that along to the board? Uh, I thought it was filed with the board. Um, I have copies. I mean, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Did you furnish one to Mr. Dejinskis? I did by email. Did you receive it, Mr. Dejinskis? Yes, sir. He's indicated he has. I just I want to clarify that, uh, Mr. Harvey, when we spoke, you had said to just email it to you and Mr. Tashinka. So that's what I did. Uh, I was not aware of anyone else I who mean, needed. Yeah, in terms of the parties, yeah, because I didn't I didn't know if he had an attorney or not, but that's why I, I uh, spoke to you in that way. But in terms of uh, your response, the board can just take a couple minutes and review it. Sure, I will. I will wait until everyone's done. Unless you're going to summarize it during your argument. I, I will be referencing it during the argument. Okay. Chair has no problem with that. No.
question. The statement of candidacy does not have a term of office on it. It only has to be voted upon the election on 4 6. Am I correct? I mean, I can't see it. I've got, I've got one right here. Yes, that, that is what the statement of candidacy says, yes. And Mr. Hervey, I'll <coughs> ask you on all of Miss Broderick's <coughs> petitions. It says a full term is sought unless an unexpired term. Mr. Chair, yes. if I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but but may I uh, present my argument oh, before I'm you sorry. go into the yeah. deliberation of it? Okay, I'm just. I'm, I'm I, I appreciate that. I just I want to make okay. sure that we you, put forth our. You do it first. I don't want to interrupt the, the board's oh, no. reading of the response, though. I, Is the board ready to hear the yes. arguments? Yes. Council. Okay. Okay. Thank Proceed. you. Maybe uh, you want to take off your mask for the court reporter. Yes. And uh, I hope you'll continue to read the response as well, as uh, I believe it's uh, <coughs> seven or eight pages. And there's a lot of good stuff there, so, so please do <coughs> take some time to read that. But I will, I will summarize it here. The most important of the arguments is that the objector has not met the bare minimum that he needs for you to grant him any form of relief. To be able to, for any tribunal, for a court or this board, to be able to award a plaintiff, or in this case an objector petitioner, relief, the objector petitioner must present facts that support his arguments and a legal basis that those facts are what he says they are. He certainly has presented facts to you. However, if you look at his petition, there is not one citation to the Illinois Election Code. There is not one reference to 10 ILCS 5 slash 10 dash 1, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's yeah. the section of the election code that applies here. What that means is he has not stated on his petition how anything that Ms. Broderick did is against the election code. Where is there a violation of the law? He says there is, but he provides no statute to support that. And without that in the petition, that is fatal to his case. The petition cannot be added to, it cannot be amended. That is in the election code. So he cannot add those citations now. The fact that he does not give you a reason other than out of his own mind why she should be kicked off the ballot means that there's no way for you to grant relief. For instance, to take this to perhaps an absurd uh, extension, the objector could allege in his petition that all of the pages need to be submitted on green pieces of paper. He doesn't cite to any statute that says that, so he's asking you to just take it for his word that they need to be on a green piece of paper. Without any statute to support it, there's no way that he can continue with his allegation. So I would ask you first, right off the bat, to say there's not enough here to support knocking her off the ballot. Beyond that, though, the arguments that the objector raises have no basis in the law. Perhaps that's why he did not cite to any statute, because there is not one that he could rely on. Nowhere in the election code does it require you to write the term of office, the length of the term of office. The election code, I'll, I'll offer it to the objector since he can't amend his petition, section 10-4 says that each petition must include the office, along with the name and the address of the person running. Section 10-5 says that it must include, the statement of candidacy must include the office, as well as the name and the address 
and some other information. Neither section mandates that the term of office be included, that the length of the duration of the term be included. He does not cite to the statute because he cannot. Instead, he relies upon the form itself and what the form says. The form says full term sought or blank, unexpired, blank year unexpired term. That form is not a statutory form. You will not, if you turn to the election code, you will not find anything that says your petitions must be submitted on a form that says yada, yada, yada. There's nothing in the statute that says full term sought or blank year un, uh, unexpired term. That does not exist. What you have in front of you when you look at Ms. Broderick's petitions are simply a model form produced by the State Board of Elections. It's a form you can use if you want to. It's so you don't have to create it yourself. But there's no requirement that you fill in those blanks. There's no requirement that you fill them in in any particular way. The form says to do it, but it doesn't matter what the form says. The form is not the law. The law is the statute, the election code. And nowhere in the election code does it require that line to be filled in in any, in any way because that line does not exist. Addressing a few more of his arguments, he mentions a lack of consistency. This is, this is the longest section of my brief, section B. He mentions that the statement of economic interest and the statement of candidacy are not consistent with Ms. Broderick's petitions. Again, he offers no statutory basis for why they need to be consistent, which means his argument fails. Regardless, I will tell you that the statement of economic interest is required by the Illinois Local Government's Ethics Act, uh, not local, Illinois Government uh, Ethics Act, Officials Ethics Act. No requirement is in that act to list the term. You have to list, you have to submit a statement of economic interest if you're running for office or if you're serving in office, you all know that, right? You're trustees, you've, you've filed your statements of economic interest. When you do that, you don't need to say, I have four years remaining on my term. I have three years remaining. It doesn't matter. It's an annual requirement. Because it's an annual requirement, you're going to do it every year no matter how long your term is. So statement of economic interest, it's irrelevant here. The statement of candidacy, section 10-5, as I mentioned, also does not require that you include the term of office, only the office. The argument that they must be consistent, while not supported by statute, is well taken. I can understand why, as I believe, Mr. Wundrick, you were pointing out, if you look just at the statement of candidacy, there's nothing there that says that it would be a, uh, an unexpired term. It just says for trustee. The thing is, though, that every single petition indicates that she wants an unexpired term. So what the courts have said, and we cite to these decisions in our brief, and I, I specifically would call your attention to the Lewis case, which I'll, I'll specifically cite the page of my brief for you, page three, Lewis v. Dunn. The important thing is not <coughs> strict compliance with the, sta the statement of candidacy matching the petitions. What matters is substantial compliance. In Lewis v. Dunn, you have the same situation. This 1976 Illinois Supreme Court case, the candidate did not include the office sought on the statement of candidacy, but the petitions did include the office sought. And the court found that that was enough. That was substantial compliance. Because when you look at the nomination papers as a whole, there's no doubt what the candidate wanted. On one sheet, the candidate didn't say which specific term. But on the 11 other sheets she filled out, she said she wanted the unexpired term. There can be no debate, no doubt, that that's what she intended. The other reason there can be no debate is if you turn to the exhibit that we included, which is the last page of our brief. The local election official is Dr. Tracy Morris. And she sent Ms. Broderick a letter on January 8th, 2021, stating that her nomination papers were for the six year unexpired term, four years remaining, that those petitions were received and accepted and that her name will appear on the ballot. What this indicates is that the local election official 
knew exactly what Ms. Broderick was running for. There was no confusion. She was able to look at the nomination papers and see that that was what she intended. Despite it not being on the statement of candidacy, she knew that it was a four year, the four years of the unexpired term that Ms. Broderick was seeking. So that is why the consistency argument of the objector does not hold. The last argument, argument C in our response, is about the specific mistake that Ms. Broderick allegedly made. The idea that there should be some prescribed way that you fill in the blanks on that sheet. Again, the form is not prescribed by the law. It is a voluntary form. You can make up your own that doesn't include term on it. It says blank year unexpired term. Ms. Broderick interpreted that to mean a six year term that's unexpired. That's why she put six. That is what it is. You're each serving a six year term. The term of a, uh, of a trustee on the board of trustees is for six years. In this case, it happens to be an unexpired six year term, four years remaining. This language doesn't say how many years are remaining. If it said a four year unexpired term, well, there is no four year term on the board of trustees. So by her interpretation, that's why she put six, because that is the length of duration of the term. The important thing is, though, that there's no confusion caused by this mistake, if you deem that to be a mistake. The local election official still knew what she wanted. She wanted the, un the unexpired term. She selected that she wanted the unexpired term. If she had left it blank and said, and then you would just assume, well, she wants a full term. And then she said, well, wait a minute. No, I wanted the unexpired term. Well, you didn't make that known in any way. She did make that known here. She checked and selected unexpired term. She just put a different number than the objector would have liked her to. There's no confusion here. It's been validated by the local election official. And again, the overarching point, the objector hasn't even raised a statutory basis for you to find in his favor. My last point is just that I would urge this board to remain objective. I know that there have been a lot of comments swirling around Ms. Broderick in other capacities, that there are other issues with her service on the board and things in the community. That is not what we are here for today. As, as Ms., uh, the chair so, uh, I think, uh, correctly put it, that is not the reason for this electoral board to be convened. I urge you to just refrain your decision, restrain your decision to just be about the issues presented by the objector and the candidate. And on that basis, find that the objector has not sustained the burden which is his to find that this was against the law in some way. Thank you. I think it'd be appropriate yeah, for please. you to have a reply. Uh, there's not any witnesses, so there's no one to cross-examine, but you certainly- I, as, I'm not a lawyer, I will admit that. No, but as the objector- but You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Better to be lucky than good, I'm told. Under the rules, you get a chance to reply. Excellent. Uh, first, I would like to clear up an inaccuracy about the statement of candidacy. Um, in fact, the full language stated that I have zoomed in on is a full term is sought unless an unexpired term is stated here, blank year unexpired term. So that is the full language on the statement of candidacy. It is not simply saying a trustee. It is very clearly delineated that unless you specify a number of, unex or at least some form of unexpired term, you are seeking a full term. So that is an inaccuracy. Additionally, the only other thing I would like to point out is that uh, my understanding of the objection process is that I need not cite case law to raise an objection, the point of, uh, the hearing is to bring up the, the statutory law and discuss that and whether or not there was a violation. And so I reply by saying my objection, I believe, stands in the light of a very well put together response. But at the end of the day, there is still a fatal inconsistency between the statement of candidacy and the petitions. And that is all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. If any members of the board would wish to question either of the parties, that's 
their prerogative, but uh, there's no further arguments or evidence to be brought before this board. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct, Mr. Dushinsky. Anything else? Yes. Thank you. So the proofs closed, the evidence is closed, and um, now the board deliberates whether to sustain the objections of the objector and remove Ms. Broderick from the ballot or to overrule the objections of the objector and that Ms. Broderick remain as a candidate on the ballot for the April 6th election. Jake, do you have any further questions of either one of the? I do not. Alicia, do you have any further questions? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Well, okay. the time? or, or of, of either uh, Ms. Broderick's attorney, of uh, Mr. Drew, or uh, any questions for Jim Harvey, our attorney, too? It's a comment. It's not a question. Okay, go ahead. It's a comment for the entire uh, hearing process. So I've also had to fill out these petitions for nomination. Um, and it does state clearly that a full term is sought. That's the first few words. Um, and it says, unless an unexpired term is stated here with a blank line where you are to indicate the number of unexpired uh, years, you can put down the number. Um, to me, as a person that's had to learn the English language, it it's pretty evident that when you fill it out, you're asking for a full year term unless you want something different. And Ms. Broderick's petitions say six year unexpired term, which um, is not consistent with what the uh, local election official, Dr. Morris, stated in her they're contradictory to what I see in, in Dr. Morris's um, letter dated January the 8th. Her letter states, your nomination papers for the April 6, 2021 election at the Joliet Junior College Board of Trustees for the six year unexpired term, four years remaining. So there is confusion. Um, that's my that's my comment. Okay. If, if I could make a comment, looking at all the petitions, and it says a full term is sought unless an unexpired term is stated here. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't put anything in that blank, it would be a full term. Mm -hmm. And, and counselor, correct, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but seeing as how she did put six year unexpired term, it doesn't say how many years are left on the unexpired term, but it was a six year term that is expired. That's my comment. Yeah, it is because there is no four year term. It's six year right. term, whether or not you're going to be serving a six year term depends on the particularities of, of, of that office. Um, yeah, that is understood. So again, I think the question was raised. It's your decision to either overrule or sustain the objection. It's got to be done by a majority. That's why there's an odd number of members. So it doesn't have to be unanimous. It can we're, be we're out all right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and these times we're all out, right? Yeah. yeah so, it, you know, um, whatever the ruling doesn't have to be unanimous. Uh, and um, it is, you are sitting as a judge and jury and it's your determination to, you know, base your ruling on what the parties brought to you. Because at the end of the day, you only meet as an electoral board if there's an objection filed. You don't meet any other time. You know, you're not like a planning commission. You're not like a zoning board of appeals. What triggers your existence is the election code, which is triggered by an objection being followed. Then you come into being. And so um, you are the determiners. If uh, a party wants to appeal, they can appeal to the circuit court. Uh, but that's what I was just going to. Yeah. But, you know, your decision today um, is is 
the end of the electoral board process. If someone would want to appeal, we have a court reporter here where a full transcript uh, can be had uh, by a party who wishes to appeal or anybody who wants a copy. Um, but um, So I guess it's up to us three. Considering we are an uh, institution of higher education where our students are maintained to the highest standard um, in their research process and uh, the way that they have to submit uh, their homework, especially in an English class, and you have to turn in a paper MLA style. Teachers are very precise and very picky on taking points off your paper when they're grading. Um, if this was a paper that we were grading, points would be deducted. Um, I am going to move to sustain the objection. Well, I think I think it's tricky because it can be read in different terms. Um, if you read a full term is sought unless an unexpired return is stated here, and she did state them a, a number there, and she was probably saying the full term is a six year and it's unexpired. So I would have to say, I'm uh, afraid uh, in favor of Maureen on this one. To be on the uh, the ballot for the unexpired term term. Just just in my opinion, so. Because I would have read it originally, but without without hearing the arguments from her counselor. I would have thought the same way, but with reading it like that, then in the six year term. Is an unexpired turn, and that is a full turn, so I have to really pay the more so. Okay, so it's my turn, huh? Well, okay. I'm confused because we have Coach O'Connell's term, which is unexpired, so I wasn't sure which one, and that one's up also. That's why there's a lot, there is confusion because of the, the three terms, the three seats, rather. I forgot Coach O'Connell's is an expired too, so. Yeah, but one was one was an appointment, and this is not an appointment; it's an election. Mm -hmm. So there, that's why cut some of the confusion could have been. Mm -hmm. um, while both Drew and Maureen's attorneys had ballot points, um, looking at you know just. The law and and how everything was filled out, I uh, I'm going to have to state my that I believe Maureen should be on the ballot. With okay. that, then there should, yeah, there there should be then a motion made to. It sounds like it's a two to one decision, but I don't want to paraphrase it. Okay. So then there should be um, a motion to overrule the objection uh, and that candidate Maureen Broderick's name remain on the ballot. Is that your motion? I can't make a motion. I mean, is, is that I, your motion? I Mr. motion, Trump? yes. Okay. Motion. Uh, so then I call roll. Call roll. Okay. Mahalik? Yes. Morales? I'm sorry, no. Wonderlich? Yes. Okay. So it's a two to one decision, doesn't have to be unanimous. I have prepared alternate decisions. Maybe we could take a brief five minute recess so I can double check, prepare a decision that will be signed because the parties are entitled to a written decision at this time in case they wish to appeal. So we'll take a five minute, five minute recess. recess. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is item number six, the hearing for case number 2021-EB-2. Do I need to come up there for that?
Brian Copeman on behalf of the objector. Is the objector here? She is not. I am here, and with the board's permission, I'd like to file my appearance at this time. I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. I'll, I'll let it open. I'm sorry. What's his last name? Copeland. Okay, thank you. Right here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Remote. Betty, she's Betty. Betty, are you on? Yes. Yes, I was muted. Um, I would like to ask a question of the board, and depending on the answer, I might like to make a record on one point. Um, this is an electoral board. By statute, it's an open uh, proceeding. The hearings of the electoral board are supposed to be open to the public. Um, I noticed on the agenda I saw on the table outside that there was a public comment section. Did Betty Washington make a comment during public comment? No, she only made a comment about the minutes of the last electoral board. Okay, thank you. I, I was out in the hall and I couldn't hear what was going on. I did hear her name at one point. I didn't know if she made a public comment or not. Nope. Okay, with that being said, I don't. I, that's all I had to ask. Okay, if you want to remain up there, you're sure. uh, the objector, representing the objector, Mr. Coatman. Why don't you proceed uh, to address the electoral board? Do, do, does every do all the members of the board have copies of the documents from the um, from the Will County Clerk's office? Well, we got the no. copies here. I guess. Is this, is Just this the original ones about? that were filed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, we got the petitions and the filing papers. So. I uh, I was under the impression that you all would have a copy of the documents that were provided by the Will County Clerk's Office. These are the documents they provided in relation to my objection. I've I got not, extra copies. I did not bring extra copies because I, I thought they had been distributed to the board. I've got extra copies. Thank you. What, what, what I'm referring to is uh, we have made just specific signature objections. There are 12 signatures that we've objected to on the petition and the County Clerk's Office as the uh, local election official is charged with having the documentation for registered voters. Uh, the petition was, a copy of my objector's petition was sent to the county clerk's office and they gathered documentation on each of those objections. And these are the official documents that you uh, should be referring to relative to each of those objections with, except, with the exception of one, because one of them is from Grundy County and I have a a uh, document from the Grundy County Clerk on that particular voter. And the, the, the documents that I believe Mr. Harvey will be providing to you have been certified by the clerk's office as being true and correct copies of those documents. 
That's nice. That means we don't have to reconvene down at the county clerk's office anymore. <laughs> exactly. Like used to have to do yes, yes. I've spent too many hours down there before. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Hart. I'll walk you through each objection, and I, I don't know how the board wants to handle if you want to hear something on all of them first and then make a decision, or if you want to go one at a time. The choice is yours, but I would, uh, before I start, I would like to approach and offer up an exhibit, uh, Objectors Exhibit 1. Um, object, objectors Exhibit 1 is a copy of the rules of procedure for the Illinois State Board of Elections. Now, this board has its own rules. They were adopted at the last uh, time this board met. I don't offer these rules to tell you this is how you're supposed to conduct your hearing, but the Illinois State Board of Elections is charged with handling these types of hearings all the time. And one of the things they do is at the, at the back of their rules, they have a, a couple of appendices, and they offer guidance on how you should consider, how an electoral board should consider specific signature objections like we brought here. And I think you may find this helpful to you when you review these signatures to understand what it is I'm pointing to and what I want you to focus on. It's merely for guidance. You don't have to follow this. You can take it and <laughs> cast it aside if you do not wish to look at it. But I think it's important and instructive to, to help assist you because I know you don't sit on these every day. These only come around every few years. And uh, with the exception of the chairman, I don't know if any of you have been on these uh, before. So with that being said, I'd like to tender uh, Objectors Exhibit 1 uh, to the board. Uh, Mrs. Washington, do you have any objection to that uh, tender? No, I do not. OK. Then uh, those will be tendered to the board. And these are mainly to aid the board in making its decision. This is not evidence. As Mr. Copeman mentioned, you've already adopted rules, but anything that can help Thank you, you with your decision, um, I think you might find productive. No. I'm just a, I'm the secretary. She's the, the board she's secretary. The president, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have four extra copies. She's, I'll take it, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, she's only the president. Uh, I'm only the president. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. I, other duties is assigned today. Mm -hmm. right. So with that, um, I, I'd like to begin walking through uh, the objections and um, make my arguments relative to the same. So our first, Mr. Coma, maybe be helpful too is I know you filed a verified uh, petition, but maybe if you could just summarize where you're going with the board, oh. so then we can follow. I know Mr. Wonderlick's been through uh, more than these than he probably cares to remember, but for all of us, why don't you just say, hey, this is my verified objection. This is what I'm seeking to prove uh, because I don't want to paraphrase your objection, but basically it's as to the amount of valid signatures sure. to, to give me a clip. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So under the, uh, the guidelines, each candidate is required to turn in a minimum of 50 valid signatures. Valid signatures are signatures of voters who reside within the district who are registered to vote, and their signatures are valid. Uh, you know, there's there's several requirements. You know, they have to sign the the petition. They have to sign next to the name at which they're registered, and uh, their signatures um, uh, signif are, are a uh, attestation, if you will, that they support the candidate for the office. Um, we have lodged objections against 12 signatures. The candidate has turned in a petition with 59 signatures. Mm -hmm. So if 10 or more signatures are found to be invalid, then she has not met the minimum number of, re of required signatures in order to remain a candidate on the ballot. The objections uh, vary 
uh, from signature to signature, but the general objections are that the individual who is signed is not registered at the address that they've indicated on the petition, or they may not be registered at all. Um, the uh, signature is not genuine. In other words, when you compare the signature on the petition with the signature we have from the county clerk's office, they do not appear to be the same. Um, along those lines, when you register to vote, you fill out an application and you have to sign for uh, attesting that you're registering to vote at the address indicated. And the clerk's office keeps a record of that signature. Whenever you change anything with your registration, you change the address, you change your name, um, whatever the case may be, if you make a change in your registration, you're required to go in and sign again. When you sign again, they keep that signature on file, okay? So that's when we say signature not genuine, we're suggesting that for whatever reason, this does not appear to be the person claimed to be signing on the petition. Um, I don't believe we had anybody who lived outside of the district, so we did not make an objection on that. We did have an objection uh, based on, uh, a couple of objections based on the address not being um, complete or, or missing. Uh, in fact, there's one where no address, no street address was given. Um, and I believe that's it. An another objection would be if someone signed twice, well then they can't count twice. But I don't believe we have any of those in this case. So what we're seeking to prove is we have 12 objections. Um, we believe once this board has reviewed them all, they're gonna find that at least 10 of them are invalid and therefore the candidate's petition should be stricken and, and she should not appear on the ballot. Um, with that being said, if you take a look at the objection, um, the verified objector's petition, and if you turn to page six, I'm going to work off of that, and that's where we've identified each uh, starting starting areas where we've identified each signature that's objected to. In the upper right-hand corner, it'll say sheet number. That sheet number refers to the petition sheet. If you look at the candidate's nomination packet, yeah. you will typically there's a um, the statement of economic interest receipt on top, there's a statement of candidacy, mm -hmm. and then it should go into the petition pages. At the bottom of each page in the middle, it's numbered. They're supposed to be consecutively numbered. I believe in this case, we have six pages, one through six. So when you look at um, the beginning of the appendix re recapitulation of the verified objectors petition, which was page six, I hope I'm not confusing you with all the page mm -hmm. numbers here. Um, our first objection is on sheet one, and then when you look down the left-hand side, you'll see um, numbers. Those refer to the line numbers on the petition pages. So when you're looking at petition sheet one, each signature or each voter or each line is numbered one through 10. So our first objection is on page one, line number five. Okay. And the basis for that objection is that that individual is not registered at the address. So now, good thing you guys have tables. Um, the third document you need to look at are the documents from the county clerk's office. Mm -hmm. And the first page is the certification of true and correct copy. Um, I hope they're in the same order as mine because they follow the order of the objections. So the, when you turn over, these pages are not numbered, but in the upper right-hand corner on most of the pages, but somewhere on every page, there's an indication of what particular signature or line the document from the clerk's office refers to. So as I said, our first objection is petition page one, line five. Uh, when you look, when you turn in the uh, county clerk's uh, packet of documents, mm -hmm. the first page, or I'm sorry, the second page, page one, line five. So what we have is um, Everett Cole is the name signed on sheet number one, line five. And if you look at the address on the petition page turned in by the candidate, it says 352nd Avenue. When you look at the clerks, the county clerks records, um, there is an Everett Cole who appears to be a registered voter, but he's registered at 316 North Bluff Street. And if you turn to the next page, um, this is a search done by the clerk's office where they've said, okay, let's look at 2nd Avenue and let's see where we have registered voters. And when you look at that sheet, 
the sheet range, it goes from uh, this. If I'm going too fast in, 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 or you're not sure where I'm referring, please let me know. I apologize. I tend to get going here. So, uh, no, I got you so the, far. So it's just, just a lot of paperwork, like you're saying. So going back and forth. So exactly. So. Thank you. Um, this, this next page, it says that they looked on Second Avenue and they have registered uh, people um, or the, 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 the range goes from, um, it, it's confusing, but it goes from 311 to 361. And you see to the right of that, it says, oh, that means odd. So they have people registered between 311 and 361 in odd numbered houses. The person in this case put 352nd Avenue. So you gotta go to the next line, and that says they the houses run from 352 to 712 E for even. So they don't have a 352nd Avenue in their um, records down at the county clerk's office. Based on that, we think the objection should be sustained. Now, yes, there's a registered voter there, but there that doesn't mean that this vote should be considered, or I'm sorry, this signature should be counted. And that's where I wanna refer you to the Illinois State Board of Elections rules. And specifically, if you look at page, it's, it's appendix B, but P, page B2. And specifically, I'm looking at section B on that page. And it talks about signer not registered at address shown. The voter's registration information shall be examined. That's what we just did. We looked at the voter's registration information from the county clerk's office. And continuing with... What, what page was that again? Oh, I'm sorry. Just, page B2. Is it on... It's on, yes. on, on this one, right? Yes. So which, which is it? Page... B, like boy, two. Oh. It's toward the back. It's a, like a couple middle. pages from the back. It's one of the appendix uh, appendices. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. There's always a slow kid in class, and that's just me today. So, so section B on page B two <laughs> refers to signature, or I'm sorry, sign or not registered at address shown. And if you simply read the first paragraph. Uh, it states, if the address on the voter's registration record does not match the address opposite the name on the petition, the objection shall be sustained. And um, I have to step away from the podium. I left something in my folder over there. Excuse me. Did you find it? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of this is governed by state <coughs> statute and um, in particular, in the election code, there are various provisions. One of those provisions is section 10-4. And section 10-4 tells you what is supposed to be on these petition papers. And it says that, um, and this is in section 10-4, it's 10 ILCS 5 slash 10-4. And, and this is just in part. It was it goes on for two pages and it lists everything that these petitions are supposed to have but the relevant portion says such petition shall be signed by the qualified voters in their own proper persons only and opposite the signature of each signer his residence address shall be written or printed that said the, the key word is there it says shall shall means it has to be there and when you look in the rest of the election code, it talks about residence address. And what it talks about is that's the address at which the individual is registered to vote. Mm -hmm. So in this case, this individual has not signed the petition next to or opposite their address where they're registered to vote. And therefore, that signature should be stricken or deemed invalid by this board. Next. Do you want me to go to the next one or I'll, I'll, whatever the board's pleasure is? I'll happy to move on. Okay. Keep on going. And we'll, okay. We know, that, we know that one's gone already. Okay. Or hopefully, or so, maybe not. Well, maybe questions. at this time, too, we could ask if uh, Mrs. Washington has, yeah. has any response to that yes. objection. Um, I can just say that I didn't know the people that signed the petition. I was at an open event early voting 
So I can't, you know, and I personally did not go through and check every signature or the addresses through the county clerk. So I have no objections uh, to going through. Um, if I may proceed then, um, our next signature that we've objected to is found on petition sheet page two, line number one. And the basis for the objection is that the uh, signer is not registered at the address shown. Um, If you refer to the county clerk's packet, page two, line one is the, the page we're talking about. It's about the fourth page in. Um, it's a long list. I, I don't know if you can see mine from where you're sitting. Um, mm -hmm. It's a long list of, of stuff. And what the clerk's office did here was they said, okay, they did a search for all the people who have registered to vote on Timber Ridge Court. When you look at line one on page two of the petition, mm -hmm. the address appears to be 4378 Timber Ridge Court, mm -hmm. uh, could be 4348 Timber Ridge Court. Either way, when you look at this sheet from the county clerk's office, there's nobody registered at either address. There's nobody registered at uh, 4378. And I think that's what the clerk's office thought it was. But when I looked at it, I thought it could be 4348. There's nobody registered at 4348 Timber Ridge Court either. So um, whoever this individual is, uh, is not registered at the address shown on the petition in there for. Do we check just for uh, for safety's sake? Because I mean, that could be a seven, could be a nine too. Is, do we check 4398 Timber Ridge Court? All I have is what the clerk's office gave in, in response. I don't know if they check that or not. I don't okay. know if it ends here. Okay. I, I, I wish I could answer the question for you, but I can tell you that based on everything we have, it doesn't appear to be uh, a valid uh, signature. This person's handwriting looks just like my handwriting. My wife would say you can say any single number out of there would be possible. So I, I, I see your point. Um, I thought it looked a lot like the first four. That's why I wasn't, you know, just. Yeah, I, I, it looks it looks like 4378 could be 4340. It could be 4398, but neither here nor there. So. It, it seems to me there is no. 4348 on Correct. the clerks. It just would have been nice. Uh, like, oh, yeah. Well, there's no 4398 either because it goes from 4300 to 4500. So if it was on there, it wouldn't be on there anyway. All so, right. I did not say you're correct. At the top, it does, it does so, go from 43 yeah. to 45. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Um, Mrs. Washington, do you have any uh, reply response to that objection? No, I don't. The next objection um, is page two, line two. And the basis for the objection is signature not genuine. So, um, what you as a board need to do is compare uh, the signature that's on the petition with the signature that's on the signature card we have from the from the county clerk's office. Um, I really don't have a comment on it. I think this one in particular, um, I, I leave it to you to look at and, and use your judgment. I, I really don't have any other comment on this particular objection. Well, everybody doesn't sign their name the same way every time. So this, this could be valid, in my opinion. I agree. I agree. I get what you I think it looks them. valid. 
think this one could I think it's bad. valid too. I get lazy when I'm signing 150 checks too, and then my signature always doesn't look the same. So, um, for the record, are we? Is the board deciding each one as we go along? Or? You know, maybe we should uh, at least start with um, this one, since I think you're overruling the objection is what I hear the consensus of the board members. So how about with this one, we do rule specifically, uh, and if the board overrules the objection, a motion overruling the objection should be made second and we'll take do we know which objection is? Is there a number so we can yeah. measure it? This would be uh, page two, line three. Page two, line three. Do we have a motion? I'm sorry. Page two, I'm line sorry. two. Page right? two, line two. Line two. Yeah, line two. two. I apologize. Yes. yes. Page two, line two. Do we have a motion to? I, I'll motion the valid. The objection. I'll motion over Second. the objection. Uh, I'm into the roll. Mahalik? Yes. Morales? Yes. Wanderlick? Yes. Okay. Thank you. The next objection is uh, page three, line three. And the basis of the objection is twofold. Page, page. Um, is it page? I'm sorry, page, page two, two, line, line three. three. Okay. It was really warm out in the hall, and I was falling asleep before <laughs> I came in here, so I apologize. Uh, page two, line three. Mm -hmm. The objection is two. Uh, there's three objections. Uh, the first is that the signer is not registered at the address shown. The second is that the signature uh, is not genuine. It does not match up. And the third objection is that the address is missing or incomplete. Having said all of that, um, with respect to line three, again, if you look at the information we have from the clerk's office, there is a uh, Violetta Thompson, which appears to be the name that's handwritten in on uh, page two, line three. Uh, but she is registered at 301 Hunter Avenue. Um, the next page has her signature. Uh, when you compare that signature to the signature that's on the petition, I see absolutely no resemblance whatsoever between the two. Um, on the petition, it looks like somebody wrote the word no, and no. And um, on the signature card from the clerk's office, we have a full signature uh, that looks like Violetta Thompson. And on the very next page, yet the, there's a third page on this from the county clerk's office. Um, they did a look at the address listed on the petition, which is 1616 East Washington Street. And all of the registered voters or names that they have associated with that address, none of them are Violetta Thompson. Um, based on that, I believe that this objection should be sustained and ask you to do so. The signature could be okay, but the address isn't right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the address is not correct, so. If we're going to do each one separately, yeah. I'm going to motion to sustain objection on this one. I would agree. Okay, no. so there's a motion and a second? Yes. Okay, roll call. Morales? Yes. Mahalik? Yes. Wonderlick? Yes. And sorry, which page number? That's page um, two, line, two three. line three. Page okay. two, line three. Okay, thank you. Now we're on page two, line four for the next one, so. Correct, thank you. Uh, page two, line four, uh, the basis of the objection is not registered at the address shown. Um, the address appearing on the uh, petition looks like 1502 Legacy Point Boulevard. The clerk's office uh, ran a search for all individuals registered to vote at that address and um, the printed voter's name appears to be Anaya Edmond on the petition sheet. Uh, there is no Anaya Edmond uh, listed to register, listed as registered to vote at that address. And therefore, I ask that you uh, sustain that objection. There is an Edmond, but it's not her. So, 
so just to clarify, if they're if they if they move and they don't change their voter registration card, then they're no longer legal to vote anywhere they go based on their new residence, right? You're asking me to give a legal opinion. <laughs> um, in answer to your question, you can move, but when you sign a when you sign a petition, mm -hmm. you have to sign it opposite the address at which you're registered to vote. Now I know some people uh, move. And because of convenience, they don't have time to change their address before the election. They go back and they vote at their old at their old polling place. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to comment on whether or not that's legal or not. Um, but if they're signing a petition, when they sign it, they have to put down the address at which they're registered to vote. And in this case, I don't think that happened. Okay, that's, I'm just clarifying just for my just for my knowledge. So. I just moved. I gotta go down and change my my, <laughs> my regis yes. photo registration card. Mm -hmm. Frequently. Do Mrs. Respond? Washington, do you have any response? Uh, no. Thank you. Okay. So we have a motion to. We, we already did that. Page two, line three. Page two, line four. Oh, now we're on page two, line four. Okay. Is that what we're, we're, oh, voting on, we're voting on that one? Yep. Yeah. To sustain? I, I sustain. motion to sustain. Second. Motion second. Roll call, please. Mahalik? Yes. Morales? Yes. Wonderlich? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, there are no um, signatures or voters that we have objected to on page three of the petition. The next objection is on page four, line number two. And the basis for the objection is uh, the signer is not registered at the address shown or the address is missing or incomplete. Um, the basis for the address missing or incomplete is it was difficult to read the address uh, next to, again, uh, the signature on page four, line two. Um, but more importantly, uh, we have from the county clerk's office, um, it looks like the address was 3616 Forest View Drive. We have the county clerk's office uh, document where they ran the list of all registered voters at that address. And um, looking at the voter's printed name, it appears to be a Nicholas Swartz. Uh, there's nobody currently registered at that address by the name of either Nicholas or Swartz and therefore I ask that this objection be sustained. Any questions? Okay, good motion and second for sustain. Well there's uh, I guess yeah, I'm just saying I see that there's the address below it's the same address as well so um, but if this that's the case I will sustain. Do you have a motion and a second? Motion to sustain. Second. Roll call, please. Mahalik? Yes. Morales? Yes. Wonderland? Yes. Thank you. Um, the next one is the very next line. Um, again, for clear, for the record, it's page four, mm -hmm. line three. Same. We have the same document. Mm -hmm. Turn the page, it's, but it's the exact same document. Um, because the same address is given 3616 Forest View Drive mm -hmm. in Joliet. The clerk's office ran that address and has provided the list of registered voters at that address. The name on the petition, if you look at the, the printed name, it appears to be Sarah Koziel. There is no Sarah Koziel who's registered at that address and therefore I ask that you sustain that objection. I have a motion and a second to sustain. Even a motion because it's it's clear as day right here, so that's fine. I'll motion. Second. Mahalik. Yes. More. Yes. Barbara. Sorry, Wonderlick. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the next one is line six on that same page. Um, the basis for the objection is that the person is not registered at the address shown. Um, there's also an objection based on the signature, and there's an objection 
based on the uh, signer's address being uh, missing or incomplete. Mm -hmm. So um, when you look at the petition sheet, page four, line six, you will see that there is no street or address given. Mm -hmm. um, there's just a line through that. And again, at this point, I would refer you to the um, state code. Mm -hmm. the appendices to the Illinois State Board of Elections rules. And I'm looking at page um, B3. And at the top of the page, you'll see it's a, there's a section D, uh, signer's address missing or incomplete. And if you refer to the second paragraph, uh, first line, if there is no address listed other than a city or a village, the objection should be sustained unless the city, town, or village street addresses either do not exist or are not commonly used. In this particular case, uh, the individual has just simply put Joliet. Uh, Joliet, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, is kind of a large city. Um, <laughs> so um, not putting an address down, uh, I think, invalidates uh, this signature um, and if you want to read the statute literally that you have to sign next to the address shown well I'm, I'm not familiar with that address it's a straight line but if there is a registered voter who matches up with this they're registered to vote at 7 North Rainer Avenue and since they don't match I would ask that you sustain this objection again this is uh, page 4 line 6 I have a motion and a second to sustain. I'd like to make a motion to sustain. I will second and there's no address on there. You can't verify it, so. Morales? Yes. Mahalik? Yes. Wonderlich. Before I vote, Betty, do you have any problem with that? No. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next objection is on uh, sheet five, line five. And the basis for the objection, signature not registered at address shown. Uh, we have uh, some information from the county clerk's office. And um, the person who signed the petition sheet signed as um, Michelle Crowder. Um, I did not do the research on this, but my client tells me that she went in to look for a Michelle Crowder. There is no Michelle Crowder uh, who's registered to vote. However, you will see that there is a petition or there are documents from the county clerk's office indicating that there is a Michelle Frank Crowder. Um, and she is registered to vote at uh, 1082 Kathy Drive in Joliet. Um, I'll leave that to you. I, I don't have any further comment on this one. I can comment on uh, Michelle Frank Crowder. That's my daughter. She is a registered voter at 1082 Kathy Drive. She got me married. I uh, entertain a motion to let this one stay on the ballot or on the uh, petition. So that'd be a motion to overrule the objection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second. That's what I said, kind of. I would. Yeah. Oh, who motion? <laughs> uh, but, um, no, well, that was um, Mr. Harvey that said that. Attorney Harvey said make I, somebody make a motion. I, I will motion for this one. So stay on the ballot. Second. Joe. Uh, Joe. <laughs> it's okay. Got it. It's a J. Mahalik. Okay. Yes. Morales. Yes. Wonderlic. Yes. I've answered the worst. <laughs> um, the next objection is on uh, page six, line one, and uh, the bases or the bases for the signature are that the uh, signature is not genuine and that the address is not complete. 
Um, so I would uh, ask you to look at the uh, petition sheet again, page six, line one, and you'll see that there's uh, uh, the voted printed name is Nicole Lyles. When you go to the information from the county clerk's office, you'll see that they provided information showing that there is a Nicole Lyles. And uh, the basis for our objection has to do with, uh, number one, her address is incomplete. She hasn't completed her full address. She's at, uh, according to the clerk's office, she's at 520 Bellarmine Drive East. She has not in indicated all of that on her, on the petition sheet where she signed her signature. But more importantly, I would ask you to take a look at the documents that are provided. I believe there's uh, three or four pages from the clerk's office and they provided uh, two uh, copies of her signature. So if she's made any changes to her signature, uh, whenever those changes have been made, she would have been required to put her signature with the county clerk's office. When you look at both of these signatures from the county clerk's office, there can be no doubt that they are not the same. Uh, they're, they're, they're not even close in terms of what the signature uh, is comprised of. You'll see two initials and a last name of, uh, looks like William or Williams uh, on both of those uh, signatures. When you look at the petition, um, there's, there's no Williams. It's uh, one initial in, in a name that I can't read. It looks like YYLIS. Um, which, which and sheet is this the, on? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it, is it page six on the petition uh -huh. sheet? Yep. Page six, line one. Yep. Line one. Okay, line one. Yep. Okay, see. And the one thing I would uh, point out, when you look at those signatures, uh, about the only thing that could be said is the first letter might be the same. But I will suggest to you to note uh, two things. Um, I'm looking for a date. Pardon me one second. Yes. Um, we have two relatively recent signatures from this individual from the clerk's office. They're both from 2018. They're both signed almost the same way, even though they're a few months apart. And when you look at that first letter, you can tell on both of the signatures from the county clerk's office that it was that first initial, if it's an N, was made with one pen stroke in the sense that the pen never left the page. You can tell with the loops and how they go around, that pen never came off the stage, or I'm sorry, off the page. When you look at the petition, purported signature and look at that first initial or letter, um, it appears it's very clear that there are two uh, pen strokes, if you will. That pen came off the page to make that first initial. It's an inconsistency. The signatures don't match in any way, shape or form. And in fact, that first letter doesn't, it, it's not the same. And therefore, I ask that you sustain the objection on that signature. I I have to disagree with you, Counselor. Why is that? Because I'm not a handwriting expert. And no, I don't, not either. So. I don't think anybody in this room is. And it seems to me that this Nicole, whose name used to be Williams, must have got married and moved. And uh, because she didn't put East Bellarmine Drive down, I think the intent to have a good signature on this petition was inherent. If I may address that, the change, uh, the move change, everything was done in 2018, according to the sheets provided by the county clerk's office, and the signature, that signature is not the same with the Williams. It's, it's, it doesn't match up. I'm usually, I, Chairman, uh, wonder, I'm 
I'm in agreement with you on these signature ones, the, the earlier one. I didn't argue because I, I, I tend to agree with you, but this one, there, there's no match. And, and if, if, if there was, I wouldn't, be saying, I wouldn't be talking as much as I am right now. Mrs. Washington, do you have any uh, response or anything to add? Only that, you know, signatures do change and we were outside and that could make a difference in how someone signs or how their signature looks. Like I said, I, I don't, I can't say yay or nay. I just know that it was an outside event and people were signing. Um, could be that, you know, they didn't have a solid foundation to write on. I can't say for sure. Any response to that? These are, this isn't a, well, they don't kind of look alike. I mean, there's like the, the first one that we looked at, I forget on, uh, I believe it was page two, line, line two. two. Um, there wasn't, you know, that they were very, they were very, they, they could be viewed as being very similar. You know, it had the same number of letters, same, same number of, uh, you know, capital letters and small letters. This one is not, they're not close. This isn't, uh, Oh, I'm cold. And my, you know, when you get cold, your your tent, your hands get a little tighter, and it's harder to sign your name. That's not what we're talking about here. Well, my my question is, isn't it? Is is her name Nicole Lyles now? Is that the name? Because she was Nicole Williams before, so I'm assuming they got married. So she because used, she used two different names, and we're going to assume that she got married. Well, her husband's right below her. I'm assuming that Lyle is the same address, so. If you're looking at the paperwork, so she probably had to relearn a signature. We're gonna learn how to relate something, so it does take a while. So, so I can't, I can't strike that one off the record, in my opinion. Well, and again, my my only response to that is where it's it's a completely different name, Williams versus Lyles, and the only one that's on record with the county clerk's office is Williams in terms of signature. That's the only one that they have. And if she made that change such that they made it on their records at the office, this well, is in 2018 the, too. This is before COVID. You so said it's not like she could screen print. It says Nicole Lyles on this other page. Is this, is this, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, it's page, page six, line one. No, we're talking about on your paperwork that you gave us. Very first, very first page. It says Nicole Lyles on it. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, 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 so, okay. And that's on 520, same address. So, so right. I don't think and then you turn the page, and the signature they have, if you look at the very top, the signature for Nicole T. Lyles is something, something Williams. Yeah, that was, her, that was her maiden name because that's what she signed originally, I think. So, right. And if that's how she signs, that's how she has to sign when she goes to the voting place to take out her ballot. And that's the same signature that should appear on a petition for nomination. And, and if you have a question about that, you go back two more pages where we have a second signature from her that was two months before, two or three months before that. It's the same exact thing. It says Nicole Lyles, but the signature is something, something Williams. I mean, so she's consistently, this is where the concern for, and I'm not, by the way, Mm -hmm. I know Ms. Ms. Uh, Washington stated earlier that, hey, you know, I didn't have a chance to check everybody's name. I understand that this mm -hmm. is not any comment on her. The only comment is people sometimes will do things to help a candidate out, candidate out that they think that they're doing to help. I understand. I'm suggesting to you that anybody could have gone in the phone book and looked up and seen a Nicole Lyles at that address. Mm -hmm. Or well, not a phone book. I'm sorry. They could have done a Google search because nobody goes to a phone book anymore. But they could have gone onto a Google search and found that name and that address, I, I, and just put it put it I, on there. I know because exactly they what you're suggesting, know. but I know it's it's sometimes. But, but the the point I was trying to make is, somebody anybody can look that up mm -hmm. and sign Nicole Lyles, mm -hmm. not know a thing about that person. Nicole Lyles may sign her name N L Williams all the time. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's maybe that's how she makes her signature different for uh, avoiding fraud and credit card theft. Maybe that's a, a, a conscious choice she makes. And I would suggest it is because we have two separate signatures from her months apart. 
Both times she's registered as Nicole T. Lyles, but both times it's N.L. Williams. That's exactly what the purpose of these cards are for, is to avoid voter fraud. So in that case, the signature that's on the petition is an incorrect signature. That's, that's what we are suggesting, and that's what we would ask this board to sustain. Mm -hmm. So do we have a motion to either sustain or overrule the objection? Well, we're questioning the, the signatures on the petition, uh, which is different from two documents months apart that don't match. So based on this, it would be a motion to sustain. Is there a second? If there's no second, then is there a motion to overrule the objection? Well, if it's based on the signatures alone, which I know when you get married, you go to the courthouse, you get your certificate, but sometimes you probably forget to go down, and change your voter's registration. I'm going to have to go agree. It's going to have the motion to sustain. So. So that's a second. A second. There's a motion and a second to sustain. Mm -hmm. So Morales. Yes. Mahalik. Yes. Wonderlick. No. Okay. It's sustained. All right. Thank you. We're nearing the end. Uh, two more to go. Um, the next objection is on page six, line six. Um, and if you see in the packet from the Will County clerk, um, the address shown next to that signature is a Grundy County address. Um, because of that, uh, I was able to, or I, I reached out to the Grundy County clerk and uh, with your permission, I'd like to approach and, and submit as uh, objectors exhibit number two, uh, the record I got from the Grundy County clerk. That's fine. Mr. Harvey, can I ask a question? Sure. So he just stated there, I thought there were 12 objections in total, correct? Uh, you know, I didn't add them up. I thought what he said at the beginning, and if there's two left, that's 10. I just no, want to make sure. Oh, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. So we would we'll have probably to go back have on to those. revisit it. We'll have to yeah. revisit the first two. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. I'm yeah. telling, so I wanted to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Darn. So again, uh, I apologize, I didn't label the page. Uh, I wanted you to see what I got directly from the um, Grundy County Clerk's Office, but this is in reference to the objection on uh, page six, line six. Uh, the objection uh, regist uh, or made is based on the uh, signer not being registered at the address shown. <clears throat> I submitted the information to the Grundy County Clerk's Office and the document you have, I've now submitted as Objectors Exhibit 2, uh, which I would, I would ask that it be admitted into evidence. It is a self-authenticating document because it does have um, the Grundy County uh, Clerk's Office seal on it that you can see or right next to the Grundy County Clerk's signature. So I move to admit it, uh, Objectors Exhibit 2. That'll be admitted. Thank you. Um, as you can see there, uh, the Grundy County Clerk uh, reviewed the records of the voters in Grundy County and determined that there is uh, no John Collins registered to vote at 55 Morgan in Gardner, Illinois, and stated that, uh, that no one by that name has been registered at that address at any time prior to January 19, 2021, which is when I obtained this document. Based on that, I would ask that this board sustain the objection to that signature. I have a motion and a second. Ms. Washington, do you have any response? No. Okay. 
based on the evidence of motion. Second. There's a motion to sustain the objection and a second. Roll call. Mahalik. Yes. Morales. Yes. Wonderland. Yes. Thank you. And then uh, the last one we have not yet talked about is the very last uh, signature on the petition, which is on page six, line 10. And you, again, <clears throat> the basis for the objection is that the signer is not registered at the address shown. Uh, the very last page of the uh, documents from the Will County Clerk's Office, um, the Will County Clerk uh, did a search for um, 1413 South Chicago Street, which is the address given um, for that signer. And uh, there's um, only two names shown. One of them is the only, there's only one active uh, registered voter at that address, but neither one of them uh, matches with the voter's printed name for that uh, signer, which is, appears to be Mary Bell Maldonado. Um, with that person not being registered at that address, I would ask this board to sustain that objection. We have a motion and a second to sustain. Motion to sustain. Second. Roll call. Morales? Yes. Mahalik? Yes. Uh, Wonderland? Yes. Um, with that, I think we've covered all the objections, although I don't think the board um, officially voted on the first two. So. Um, should I sure, let's re revisit recap those, okay. uh, Mr. Coltman, for the, so we have a clear record. Um, going back to the beginning, uh, the first objection was on sheet one, line five. And uh, that appears to be a voter by the name of Everett Cole. And on the petition sheet, uh, he indicated that his address was 350 Second Avenue. We have uh, information from the county clerk's office indicating that there is an Everett Cole registered at 316 North Bluff Street, um, and that there doesn't appear to be any anyone registered at a 350 Second Avenue. That's uh, the next page of the um, clerk's packet. Based on that, I would ask that uh, this board sustain the objection that the signer is not registered at the address shown opposite their name. Motion and a second to sustain. Motion to sustain. Second. Roll call. Morales, yes. Mahalik, yes. Wonderlick, yes. All right. And then um, the next one, which I think is the last one that you have not uh, decided upon yet, is on page two, line one. The basis for the objection is that the signer is not registered at the address shown. Um, this is the one that we talked about earlier where uh, the address appears to be 4378 Timber Ridge Court, maybe 4348, maybe 4398 Timber Ridge Court. Mm -hmm. What we have from the clerk's office is their listing of all voters who are registered to vote anywhere from 4300 to 4500 Timber Ridge Court. Um, there's nobody indicated on this list at 4348, 4378, or 4398 Timber Ridge Court. Uh, based on that, I would ask that the board sustain the objection to that signature. Oh, motion to sustain. Second. Roll call, please. Mahalik? Yes. Morales? Yes. Wonderlick? Yes. And with that, I think that's, I think we've covered all of them. Thank you. All right, I show 10 sustained and two overruled. So that leaves us with 50. Hmm? That leaves us with 50 signatures. That, I don't know, I'm just based because on my tally. she had tallies. a total of 60 signatures on her ballots. Page five, line five was overruled and page two, line two. I have the ten, 10 objections were sustained, correct? 
Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. And two were overruled. There, fifth, two, right. So 10 were sustained, 59 signatures were submitted. So if 10 were sustained, that would take her down to 49, and therefore she doesn't have enough. Based on that, I ask that you sustain the verified objector's petition and uh, um, not allow uh, Ms. Washington's uh, name to appear on the ballot as a candidate for uh, trustee of the board. Mrs. Washington, do you have a response? No. That's right, she has nine on that one page. We need a motion to to sustain the objections that you articulated, and that will be in the court reporter's transcript as to each one. You know, any decision we're not going to write out, but it appears that you sustained sufficient objections that she doesn't meet the fifty petition number threshold and, and that's why i wanted mrs washington to 50 because she didn't have 60 she only had 59 right i mean i mean and unfortunately and i know we discussed some of the general law before this hearing generally speaking a lot of the provisions you know even some of these signature objections does it substantially comply with the law you have discretion because you know, generally speaking, you want the voters to decide, not this board. But one thing is mandatory, and that is the number of signatures. Yeah, I mean, and, and this is, you know, uh, I mean, this really drives it home. But it appears that uh, Mrs. Washington, unfortunately, is one signature short, and you don't have discretion to waive it. And um, it's something that is not substantial compliance. You either have the bare minimum or you don't. And so, um, you know, what it sounds like here is you'd be sustaining um, the objections as to 10 signatures, which um, would result in Mrs. Washington not being able to be placed on the uh, ballot at the April 6th, 2021 election. But she does have the option to appeal. She certainly does. She can appeal this to the circuit court. Um, but uh, if that's the case, then I would suggest you make that motion and I'll prepare a written decision. So we have a motion a second to sustain Mrs. Washington's petitions. Or sustain the objections, the objections as to sorry. her petitions. Yeah. To the petitions. A motion. Second. And there's a motion and a second. Roll call. Mahalik. Yes. Morales. Yes. Wonderland. Yes. And we'll recess for about five minutes while we uh, have a written decision prepared by the board so we can serve it on Mr. Coltman. And then the decision, since Mrs. Washington isn't here, will be mailed to her. Okay. That's what the election code requires. And then we'll, then this, uh, board will be finished with its business. So we'll take a brief five minute recess, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. Oh wait, don't you, don't you? To adjourn. Oh, okay. No, we didn't. Yeah. Right, you already made the right. motion. You sustained the objection, correct? That's right. We, we yeah. the vote. The board has, written, has, has uh, adopted a written decision and I acknowledge receipt of that decision. Thank you. Mr. Coleman, I acknowledge the receipt and a, um, a copy will be sent to Mrs. Washington. And she's not present today. There's no further business before this electoral board. And I have a motion and a second to adjourn. Motion. motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.